I received a letter from none other than Noitira, uh, said that you have to develop a biblical understanding of hybridity in Old Testament. Wow, that's a big task. I don't, don't know how can I do a devotion as well as give you the overall picture. But nevertheless, I think uh, we <coughs> have uh, find a definition as we have this session. Uh, this is a very historic consultation because uh, <clears throat> the GDN, the Global Diaspora Network, is plotting a new track that has been neglected or has not been defined by any mission society or many, all the missiology. But now as we focus on global diaspora, I think that's a very important concept. And uh, we hopefully through this consultation, we come to a very concrete definition as well as know how to do it. Uh, you might, may have heard a word because I'm a Chinese, allow me to say these few words. God created the world, but everything is now made in China. <laughs> but I'm a Chinese Filipino born in Philippines, holding a Filipino passport. But now Filipinos are all over the world too, as well as the Chinese. And as we look at the diaspora, there are many things that we need to get uh, involved with. But on this topic, uh, how should we deal with it? Is it possible to uh, have a people group that maintain their own identity? How should we define hybridity? I think yesterday, uh, <clears throat> Juliet has defined for us, according to mixture of blood or mixture of culture, but uh, should we also include language? <clears throat> uh, I like to <clears throat> have a diachronic study of hybridity in diaspora in the Old Testament and uh, to explore the mission day that will be relevant to the 21st century. I think we are gathered here for a very important task to define and hopefully come up with some solution. As we look through the patriarchal era, we notice that God walked with the patriarchs, walked with them, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But biblically, as we look through it, we know the difference of language and perhaps ethnicity and even culture come after the dispersion of the Tower of Babel. As we look back to the text in Genesis 11, uh, linguistically, West Semitic language and East Semitic language has its own difference. Culturally, the people group as defined in Genesis or even in Old Testament they have some affinity with each other. I think as we look at the people of God, the Israelites, who are they? How should we define them? If we define them as coming out of the ore of Chaldean, then they are similar to the people there living in that area. But nevertheless, I think let's look to the text. We know that in the, in, uh, the book of Genesis, they sojourn in the land of Canaan. God brought them out, brought Abram to the land that God pointed him to. And he sojourned in that area. And he lived a nomadic lifestyle, meaning uh, God compels them to move from one place to the other place because of their nomadic lifestyle. But as we look through uh, <clears throat> The life of Abraham, I know significantly we know that he, he lived behind the pagan gods in that area in Ur. And he come to worship and serve El Shaddai, the God Almighty. And God revealed himself as he promised to Abraham. I think all of us may be familiar with Genesis 12. Promised him with a land, with heir, and with heritage, with blessing. Those who bless you. I will bless them. But the most important part as we deal with Genesis is the sins of the Amorites. In Genesis 15, not to deny that there are people group living in the land of Israel, it keeps talking and name the groups, the people groups living in that area. And God would want to wait for the sins of Amorites and they, God will throw them out. But Abraham and his descendants had to wait. A test case of hybridity 
is in the life of Jacob and his family. I think as we read through the book of Genesis, it is very ancient because it tells stories. And as we tell stories, it tells us the story of Abraham and all his struggle. But Abraham had a faith in our God. With God promised him to have heir and to have a seed from his own uh, on the womb of Sarah. Well, he believed in the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteousness. And to make sure that his descendants would continue to hold on to the faith, he would like Isaac to marry someone of the same faith. And so I think we have a, a, a list or, or a Genesis where we know for sure that uh, this is something that we like to speak to our congregation. But then the test case is with Jacob and his family. I think most of us are familiar that Jacob ran away after he was cheated with Laban. But when Laban ran after Jacob, I think we all know that something is hidden underneath, underneath uh, Rachel's uh, butt. And uh, he's, she's seated there, and there is what we call the, the gods, the family gods. How would that kind of thing evolve? Or how come a faithful family or a family of faith would hold on to these household gods? I think that is something that is influencing many of our Christian family today. I think many still hold on to a lot of superstitious behavior. Would Laban, Rebecca, continue on that faith to Rachel? But that is actually an influence, a hybrid culture that influenced that family. And as we look through Jacob, Jacob, after he had time with his brother, he assigned them to live in the land of Goshen. Of course, the scripture would tell us that people hated the shepherds, that the Egyptians despised the shepherds. And the scripture also tells us it is really a beautiful place, meaning this group of Israelites, they separate themselves from the Egyptians. But lo and behold, as we look to the text carefully, we know that Joseph married the daughter of an Egyptian priest. And that marriage did not influence Joseph. But as we look carefully, we know that God in the book of Genesis is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And he is the living God. Joseph holds on to his faith. As we look through the Mosaic era, the time when Moses started uh, uh, working or start uh, be, uh, responding to the call of God, we know that diaspora and migration, they were forced into living, the Israelites were forced into living in Egypt. But God delivers them out of misery and through the ten plagues in the Red Sea. As we look through the text of God delivering his own people, let my people go. Let my people go. The Am in scripture in Hebrew is very particular. Am means my people, God's people. Even as I say, I said, comfort, comfort my people. That's the same word, Am, a very important concept. It's an exclusive word being applied to something that God on them. But lo and behold, we looked at the text that there are other people who joined them. They joined them in the Exodus event. At Mount Sinai, I think God gave them a very important lesson. God teaches them at Mount Sinai, telling them I, they will become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God revealed to them and God teaches them. Why do why does God need to teach them about this lesson? Because of what the incident that follows immediately. Aaron and the people, knowing that Moses is up in the sky for 40 nights and 40 days. And they approached Aaron and said, Aaron, can you help us? 
find a God or created a God that can lead us and continue to accompany us. And Aaron helped them build a golden calf. Uh, Aaron, just like any of the minister today, solicit the nation or ask for offering. And they give them all the things that they can have. And as Aaron explained to Moses after he was confronted, he said, I throw them into the fire and suddenly a golden calf appeared. Come on. Well, is that possible? Of course, he had to craft them. And Moses was so disappointed with Aaron. But look at it. Aaron and all the people had the concept of God, a visible God that they can hold on, that they can create. And sad to say, God revealed to them at Mount Sinai and given, even given them the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not create any idols before me. But nevertheless, Moses confronted Aaron and as the new group was about to enter the land of Canaan, Moses especially explained to them about the great God, teaching them about the history, teaching them how to love the Lord. And the people had to recite the Shema. And the Shema is actually for them to love the Lord. Shema Israel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, your God is one and that is really a very important concept. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And they have to recite them every single day. Wanting them to know that they have a great God, a unique God. They should trust Him and He is someone who give them the land of Canaan. And so Moses bring them to that idea. And allow them to hold on to their faith. Although they may be, they are entering a land of Canaan full of problems, full of cultures. But nevertheless, the Lord wants them to hold on and know that He is a great God. He's a unique God. As we enter pre-monarchical era, we know that uh, <clears throat> this is a time where Joshua and the elders led them to serve the Lord. They were able to get the land that God has promised and they were able to find rest. And this kind of rest is a very important concept. The book of Hebrews in New Testament continue to talk about this rest. There is a land and there is a rest. Rest in the bosom of our Lord Jesus Christ. But as we look through Joshua, we know that Joseph remind them that they have a choice. And they have an issue of hybridity. In his last sermon to the Israelites, he said, Do you want the gods of Chaldean? Do you want to worship the God of Egypt? Do you want to worship the gods here in Canaan? But as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. Or we will serve the Lord. It is a very important concept and a commitment of Joshua wanting to serve the Lord. And uh, in this same era, we know that... Uh, <coughs> Everyone did whatever it pleases in their own eyes. And a very important uh, concept right here <clears throat> is the hybridity. There is intermarriage of the Israelite, the people of God, with the people in the land of Canaan. And I think we are very familiar with Jephthah sacrificing his daughter. Perhaps uh, the, a lot of Old Testament scholars or even biblical teacher would try to defend Jephthah. Maybe daughter, his daughter never were, was, was sacrificed in that altar. But if you notice where Jephthah had this idea, he had the Ammonites' background and did, did sacrifice, he did sacrifice his daughter. That's the hybridity culture of Canaan influencing Jephthah. He did whatever is pleases in his own eyes. But right in the, in the midst of darkness, we know that we have Ruth who hold on to the faith. And she said, your people is my people, your God is my God. And as we look through the Philistine war, right before they, they had Saul before them, you know that they thought that, that religious relics, the art, would fight for them. 
But nevertheless, Philistines is more powerful. The Philistines got hold of the art. Samuel challenged them to put away their bells and their ostriches and serve God only. The sedentary life uh, of mixed uh, life mixing Canaanite culture bring about the danger of hybridity in their religious belief. Let's move on to monarchical era. We saw David. David is a man of God. David is a little shepherd boy. When Samuel is about to anoint or select another king, he looked for outward and height. But David is really quite small. But David is a shepherd boy, and David gave us a beautiful psalms. I think all of us are familiar with Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And Psalm 16, it's a, it's a golden psalm telling us that God gives us many different good things. Every good thing comes from Him. And in the book of Psalms, we know that He worshiped the Creator God, who is the Creator of the universe. But Solomon and Rehoboam, his descendants, because of all the things that they can enjoy, I think power, sex, and aggressions are cultures of the day. Are this not the same kind of struggle that we may have today in the 21st century as we discuss hybridity? In God's design, the Garden of Eden, marriage means one man and one woman. I think as we discuss all this marital issue, even today as we discuss with same-sex marriage, let us go back to the, God's, the, the design that God has given us in the Garden of Eden. What well, an exilic era, they worship the God who is alive. In Ezekiel, I think most of us are very one, uh, would wonder how come Ezekiel 1 had lots of symbols. The symbols of the four living creatures. And sometimes it's really hard to explain that portion. How come the four living creatures is there? But that's really the hybridity of religious belief. While the Egyptian gods are not moving, while the Babylonian gods are not moving, they are stationed, they are curved on the Babylonian temples. And art forms are not moving. But the art forms in the scripture is moving. They are the four living creatures. But the most important part is as we look to Ezekiel 1, the emphasis is on the living God seated on the throne. And this is how Ezekiel portrays his God as the living God. God is alive. In the early era, as we look through the book of Psalms, God is the king of the earth. They are monotheistic. They declare that God is the only king. He is the only God. You shall worship the Lord, the true God, the Yahweh, the Adonai, the Lord God. But if you carefully look at the book of Psalms, they were influenced by the religious belief of those days. There are some gods. There are some gods around. And as we, as we discussed about the, the theology of the book of Psalms, Look through Psalm 95, facing realistically the gods in the Babylon. The Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. Above all gods. In Psalm 97, verse 7, the Lord God is to be feared above all gods. The gods are to worship the Lord who reigns on high. The gods are to worship the Lord on high if the gods are not real. For some Israelites, they were influenced by the Babylonian. So Psalm 97, verse 7, Psalmists would declare to those who perhaps hold on to some fake belief, the gods will worship our Lord who reigns on high. Is this orthodox theology? Think about it. As we look through the post-exilic era, I think we are so familiar with uh, a very strict rule given by Ezra and Nehemiah, even Malachi. 
Malachi said uh, <clears throat> that uh, they should uh, only stick on and worship, bury the, their own, own people. But namely in Ezra and Nehemiah 7, there are many hybrids. There are many non-Jews. There are many people who are embedded into the society, into their community. And it's the in their nameless. And it appears twice in book of Esther and Nehemiah. But reading Torah at the water gate, the square at the water gate, Nehemiah 8, that is a very important time for them. How come they did not read the Torah in the temple? Esther bring a lot of goodies, lots of things, so that they can repair the temple. But how come they didn't read the Torah, the Word of God, in the temple? They, worked, they, they read the Word of God, and it was read in that square before the water gate because they want to be creative. They want to include the women and the children and those who understand. Today, if we were to go to a Jewish synagogue, if you are a woman, you are not allowed to enter that important area. You are either secluded or you will be asked to go to the second floor. But the scripture is always ahead of our time, telling us that the word of God is to be read. The joy of the Lord is our strength. In conclusion, the Israelites living with the people around them, definitely they would be influenced by the concept of, they will be influenced by culture and challenge of hybridity. Some hybridity in the cultures are good for them. There are things that they appreciate and they absorb them. Of course, there are some that are not good for them, but moving other people groups, bringing them to the fear of God does not affect their faith. Marrying other people if not affect, affecting their faith in God, the Lord would allow them to do so. Across its era, the Israelites faced with different challenges. The Lord commands us to uh, continue to reveal himself to them as the God who is alive and cares for them. As we <clears throat> close our session this morning in our devotion, our God, the Creator God, is a creative God. And Everything is good in his sight. Everything is good. And one of the things that is, is like towards the ending of uh, Old Testament, one of the phrases that they like to, to, to encourage each other, Ki hasdo leolam, for his loving kindness is forever, including the hybrid people around us, including the hybrid culture that challenging us, including the hybridity that we are discussing. God is alive and continue to care for us. May God bless each and every one of you.